Okay, welcome everyone. Rarely do we have an opportunity to have two of the world's leading researchers uh, and diving medicine experts in one place at one time where you have an opportunity to pick their brains. So the way we're gonna do this is you are gonna ask the questions, they will respond to the questions and we'll go as far as we can during the time that's allotted. So do we have a question? Okay, question in the front right here. One of the um, the things I end up saying a lot is there's not enough research in that area. Uh, you know, we don't have millions of dollars of research budgets to spend on all these projects. Um, what we do have is lots of divers who are really passionate. How can divers get involved in diving research? Okay, Sandra. Well, Mark, thanks for this. Question, <clears throat> you know that that has been one of my uh, preferred topics, uh, starting to involve divers and become what we call the research divers. Naming a research diver so in, in, in that way doesn't mean that the diver does research. Uh, but it means that the divers can collect uh, data to help us having enough data to reach or get close to big data systems or big lakes and to uh, uh, give us the wealth of the variability that will actually provide the final answer. Um, the performance of divers that, that we have involved in this uh, endeavor is surprisingly good. Uh, they follow the rules, they provide the data, and at the end, they even get to the level of understanding whether the data are good or bad, to the point that using music, for example, as a, as a modality of training, we have taught the divers to perform Doppler bubble recording. Uh, precordial, essentially, precordial. Now with the subclavian, see, it's relatively easier. Precordial is a bit more difficult because you really have to spot the right area and to understand whether the the music or the, the, the noise, but it has a rhythm, so it's music. And actually, we were teaching them uh, almost as a dancing music class, you know, because they 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 were taught to dance according to the, the heart rhythm. And by the end of this, of the first five years, we started this in 1993. By, by the end of the century, uh, our rejection rate was less than 5%. And we managed to collect thousands and thousands of recordings. We went a bit further and uh, we started teaching them also how to record images with a four chamber cardiography. It's a bit more compli complicated, but now that you have the portable um, echographs and, and this is becoming available, uh, it, it also proves to be uh, effective because you don't teach them how to interpret an echocardiography with the cardiac parameters and so on, but you teach them how to get a good image. So it's teaching photography. Yeah. Simon? Oh, one of the things I always say about our field is that um, diving medicine is, is a fabulous field for junior researchers or even divers themselves because there's so many low-hanging fruit things that are still to be done in our field that in any other field of medicine or physiology would have been done 50 years ago but because diving is a relatively naive science and because there's not a lot of funding there's lots of questions still to be answered so it is a super cool place for citizen scientists to be doing their thing how do you get involved well uh look out for research projects. So people like Sandro collecting big data, 
getting involved in that. And look, there are <clears throat> there are projects that are quite easy to do in that regard. I mean, I, the Finnish guys are here somewhere. I pointed out to them uh, just the other day that uh, one of their colleagues has just published a really neat paper in Diving and Hyperact Medicine Journal where they followed uh, 50 Finnish technical divers over a year. They got them to record all of their dives and all of the outcomes and what they did in response to any problems that they had. It's a fabulous little study because it answers a couple of important questions like how often are technical divers getting mild symptoms of decompression sickness and doing nothing about it? June uh, 2022. So read that in Diving and Hyperact Medicine Journal. Um, so sign up to be involved in research. You know, we we do lots of stuff where we need diver subjects. And actually, we find the community is incredibly responsive. They just love it, you know. So, I mean, it, it, it's not an easy thing if you're just kind of sitting there thinking, what's a research project that I could do? But if that is what your thing is, maybe talk to a, to someone like Sandra or myself or Oscar here. You know, there's there's people everywhere who are doing this stuff. So it's not that hard to get involved if you want to. Sandra? And even if we tend to talk about medicine and, and physiology, there are ample spaces for other research that fits the citizen science paradigm. And for example, uh, over the last five years, we have been uh, involved in a number of uh, uh, EU Horizon 2020 funded projects on uh, marine protected areas and the invasion of alien species from both the uh, Suez Ch Canal and, and the Gibraltar Strait. And there are modalities to teach the divers not only to recognize a species, but also to do what normally bi marine biologists do, that is the transects. Uh, imagine that if you only had marine biologists, the number of transects, the transect is a, an exploration length. Uh, it's a unit, in other words. So the more you have, the more data you have. Imagine how many transects can a couple of biologists do in their whole life. Multiply it by 10,000 or 100,000 divers, who are taught how to do it properly, and you have the big data that we need. Yeah, good. Mark, you had a question. Yeah. It's not on. Virtually, sorry, can you hear me now? Virtually all divers carry a sensor and recording package in the form of a computer. Uh, we talked earlier today about the fact you have things like ISO standards where manufacturers and training organizations are getting together to agree how to do things. Can more be done in terms of collecting data from all of these divers out there with their little computers on their wrists? And would you like to see the manufacturers standardize in any way the data that is output? Would that be helpful at all? That's similar to private data exploration. Uh, um, it has been done to an extent uh, by developing a, uh, a data exchange system or software. Uh, which was called DL7 and then DL8. It was developed by Peter de Noble initially uh, at Dan, and now we are using it. And thanks to that, most of uh, the current dive computers uh, can send compatible data to a central database. So there is a common language, in other, in other words, which goes beyond the proprietary software, uh, the firmware of the computer itself. Uh, now it's a lot more easier than it used to be because we have the uh, uh, ZXU uh, format, which is pretty universal. And this is what we are now using to collect data from the, uh, from the dive computers of any diver. Clearly, if you collect only the dive computer data, you are missing uh, an important part of the information that is the behavioral part. Uh, if you put together the behavioral part and the electronic dye profile, and then you add it on, on a platform of epidemiological data analysis, such as, for example, if you have a population that you know the characteristics of, and you have also a number of people who get hit, who have, have an accident, and the others are who, who uh, 
uh, conclude uneventful lives, then you have what we are all looking at as scientists and researchers. You have a, a numerator and a denominator. And, and there is where you can, you can do some epidemiology and also some preventive medicine or preventive behavioral studies also. So, yeah, I think that's right. Uh, the problem with dive computer data on its own is you don't have outcomes. So the dive outcome is a critical part of it. And this is what Dan attempted to do with their project dive exploration in America a few years ago. And it went on for quite a long time and they collected you know, several hundred thousand dive profiles plus yes, yeah. the dive outcome. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, until we have a way of bringing all of that together, just dive profiles from computers on their own aren't particularly useful. Uh, but, you know, being able to use those data in specific research projects that Sandra is talking about, of course, that's useful. But, yeah, it, what we what would be, if I could wave a magic wand, you know, wouldn't it be great if every dive that was done was downloaded with the dive outcome into a central repository? That would be awesome. But, I mean, that making that happen is very difficult. But you need the outcome. And actually, the outcomes are even better if they're objectively measured by someone who knows what they're doing. You know, just a diver saying, oh, I was fine, is not necessarily, you know, you, you just don't know whether that's true or not. So it's a tr it's a nuanced issue, Mark. Um, yeah, yeah that <clears throat> pro project dive exploration he was referring to is something that Dan America was doing. And they had trained uh, interns who would go out to various dive locations and they would collect information by downloading the computers. And then they would follow those divers post dive and then post trip. So they knew what the outcome was. We now have uh, a continuation of that program in that Europe. It goes under a different name now. It's called DSL, Diving Safety Lab. And uh, it's twinned with a, a real-time feedback to the diver. You will see it tomorrow. Uh, that does a deco, what I used to be called DRA, deco risk analysis. Now I prefer to call it dive risk analysis. And shows the diver what has been done what should have been done, what was the ideal profile, and has an outcome measured, not clinically measured, but measured in terms of supersaturation achieved by the, the most saturated compartments. So it, it's something that's pretty useful to do briefing, debriefing, teaching, to reach awareness of, of what one does underwater. Okay, we have another question. Yes, yeah. over here. Um, my name is Manuel Simas, and um, I would just like to ask a question. I'm one of the founders of a company where we are restoring the entire seabed uh, with uh, what we call engineered reefs, and uh, we're bringing the complete restoration of not only the flora, but also the fauna. Um, as a second step, that will become an oasis for divers to go and dive and do their uh, recreational or maybe even the sporting events then. Um, our objective is to be uh, building worldwide a number of reefs. Um, we have three uh, targeted here in Portugal and a couple of them in Asia. The question I have, especially for the researchers, one of the things we will be doing is underwater, we'll be building um, technology that's going to monitor the health of not only the flora, but also the fauna. And uh, we wanna bring this technology, this uh, data that uh, we collect at the bottom of the ocean down uh, up to the surface and from the surface to the cloud. So the objective uh, of doing that is to provide not only divers, but also researchers, but also uh, the academ uh, um, academia, but also governments, all the information around the oceans uh, that we don't have today, and all that in real time. Question. Uh, when we look at uh, smart cities, we know that communication is done through Wi-Fi or 5G. That sort of communication doesn't exist under water. Are you aware of any, on a research side, communication which has been done not through umbilical cords, because that we can do, but uh, any other communication will be done equivalent to a Wi-Fi or to a 5G, but underwater. 
Yeah, I think that's Sandro's. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I think he's going to talk. Can I uh, with my presentation much. tomorrow? <laughs> uh, we are actually now uh, since 2019 uh, and after a EU funded project, which was called uh, uh, CADI, which meant uh, Cognitive Autonomous Diving Body. Uh, and it was a actually a robot that was interacting with the divers, also interpreting the diver movements uh, to the point that the project developed a language which was called Cadian and, you know, recognized the stress uh, motion by the diver or the OK sign or something like that. Over uh, during that study, uh, the University of Newcastle in the UK developed a, a very uh, effective system of uh, data transmission underwater uh, because the, the limits of wireless transmission, why, if you wire a, a, a diver, there is no problem. But wiring a diver, putting a diver on a leash is not really what we want. Uh, but wireless is not easy underwater. Uh, Bluetooth is centimeters. Light is promising, but the current technology is very poor. Sound is much better. And uh, the, the University of Newcastle had developed uh, a very efficient uh, model or, or modality to use sound and to uh, use sound to convert electric signals into sound and then back to electric signals with an acoustic modem. And this is what we are now using. In 2019, we are using it to uh, collect physiological data from the bottom, from divers, obviously. And uh, in 2019, I'll show you tomorrow, we also uh, could uh, perform bi-directional communication with uh, something like SMS messages short messages with divers. Uh, so yes, there is a, a modality, it's not perfect yet. Um, it's, it, it's powerful because sound can reach up to three kilometers if you have a line of sight. But if you don't have a line of sight, you're done. Um, if you use it to, for example, for cave exploration, you need a lot of further technology, transponders or cabling, the, 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 the modems. So there is much to be done. The future is probably light, but, uh, but the technology at the moment limits the valuable data transmission to something between 10 and, and, and 20 meters max. So it's, but there are hopes that this technology will develop and be useful. And you'll find out more about that tomorrow, is that right? Uh, you, will, you will see all that we have done since 2019 till now, tomorrow with, uh, my, with my presentation. Any addition? Okay. Sorry, <laughs> hello, my name is uh, Teresa. I'm a researcher um, and recently I'm uh, leading a project in Africa, in Cape Verde. Uh, it's scientifically driven, it's ecological driven, but I'm including all the disciplines um, in the project. And by going to Cape Verde for already so many times, I uh, became friends with uh, a lot of fishermen there. Um, and I'm actually including the fishermen in the project. So. I'm renting their boats. I'm renting actually their, their knowledge to see if I can also convince them to dive in a different way. So they all dive, although they don't have uh, open water diving course, <laughs> uh, but they all dive. And um, I'm trying to convince them that they are not diving safe. They all have um, very crazy diving plans like a friend of mine go to 45 meters and he stays 45 minutes with a 18 liter tank. And then it just comes up to the surface whenever he doesn't have any more air. And he does this since 20 years, 
and nothing has ever happened to him. I have another fisherman that he goes uh, for shells, seafood, let's say, and then it goes to 20 meters uh, four times a day with a surface interval of 10 minutes. And then he has, I don't know how many times he has on the boat. So I'm reading, although my field is not yours, I'm reading your papers just to actually to um, to answer them to uh, because they all said say to me look I'm diving for the last 20 30 years nothing has ever happened to me in the island I only know one guy that had um, decompression accident um, but other than than that all of them they are actually pretty healthy. And so I know what you're going to tell me, that each individual is an each individual, that we have a very big buffer in our models. But I'd like to ask you, what shall I tell them? <laughs> <laughs> and, and for instance, I'm including them in my dives. I'm teaching them indirectly how to dive safe. So I'm putting them diving uh, and collecting photos with me and doing transects, um, but you know, whenever they go for their lobsters and for their shells because they have to survive, they keep on doing that. I yeah. I actually gave them my computer, my Galileo Sol, my old computer, and uh, in order that you know they see that they are not diving safe, but they still do it. And I don't know what to tell them. There, there's actually an extensive uh, literature describing exactly what you just, the story you just told has been told many times in respect of many populations, indigenous sea harvesters all over the world. Uh, and your story is pretty much the same with one exception <clears throat> that usually on their way to work each day, they walk past a very large graveyard of all the other divers in their village who aren't well and who died during their diving jobs. So what you usually find is that there is a small self-selected population of survivors in these groups. And they do seem to be somewhat uh, resistant to decompression sickness. Now the basis of that resistance, we're not sure of. There is some evidence from some of our European colleagues that you can breed uh, resistance to decompression sickness in rats so there is a genetic component to it and there's probably other things that we don't understand but in terms of what you can do I think you're doing exactly the right thing I, I mean attempting to educate providing them with monitoring equipment which they don't usually have for depth and time and providing them with guidelines and options if they do get sick I think that's about all you can do. I mean, it's a it's a problem in multiple locations all over the world. And you hit the nail on the head. I mean, these people are just trying to survive. They're trying to make a living. They don't have any options, really. And as they, as they clean out all the lobsters shallow, they start going deeper and deeper and deeper. And eventually, they, they do run into problems. I mean, I would say to this guy, look, this is fine, but you haven't been injured so far. That will work until the day that you do get injured. And you almost certainly will if you stay on this trajectory. I, I don't know if you've got anything else to say, Sandra, but <clears throat> it's a tr tricky one. I, I couldn't agree more. There is also a very recent publication that I reviewed very recently to, uh, that uh, speaks exactly the same words that Teresa spoke now. I'd like to make an example. Let's go in another extreme environment for a while. And let's go on the top of the Andes or the Himalaya mountains. Uh, as you know, one of the problems that we normal human beings face when we go up to extreme altitude, much before brain edema, is pulmonary edema. <clears throat> and pulmonary edema is something that affects brethel divers more frequently than occasionally also scuba divers. Uh, we did a study on a population of 330 expert brethel divers 
and we found that about 25% had at least once in their free diving life. Sorry, I, I'm speaking about free divers. Maybe I said scuba diving. <clears throat> at least once in their free diving life had experienced a more or less serious episode of pulmonary edema. We convinced them to, to accept a CSI attitude, so we swapped them and did a genetic test. And there is a difference between those who were subject to pulmonary edema and the ones who were not. Uh, we tested a number of um, <clears throat> phenotypes, but one especially, the ACE, the angiotensin converting enzyme phenotype, showed a very interesting difference. Those who had never suffered a pulmonary edema had exactly the same phenotypes of the Andine and Himalayan populations. So over there, there has been a natural selection. Over here, there is the natural variability of those who resist a certain extra, extraordinary exposure to hostile environment and those who do not. And speaking about DCS, <clears throat> we know that there are bubblers who never get hit and non-bubblers who get hit. And there is a study from our good friend Rana Rieli, who, who studied what can hydrophobic spots on the endothelial layer do or, or, or do not. And that also is a difference that lays within the individual. And that can explain how one can react better or worse than another one. Mm -hmm. To the last question, what you're doing is the right thing. They are already probably naturally selected to be resistant. So you can make them better divers, safer divers for their family, for their product, for their uh, earning their daily living. Okay. No, 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 mic. no, mic. <clears throat> the thing is that I'm trying to convince the government, as you know, uh, to have hyperbaric chambers in Cape Verde because they aren't. Uh, there are a lot of tourists going there for, for diving, of course. And uh, the government tells me, well, we don't need one because our fishermen don't need one. They never have a decompression disease. So uh, we, we don't need, they don't need insurance. They don't need anything. So, you know, that is why I have a big problem. Uh, there is a precedent there. Um, there has been a study in Vietnam uh, where they actually applied and taught in water recompression to these uh, rare cases where the natives were, were hit. And uh, a French colleague of ours published uh, about three hours ago, uh, three, three uh, years ago, the, the modality they use. So that could be, you know, the escape way. Other than that, if I were one of the rulers in Cabo Verde, I would say, well, what's the need? They never get hit. They, never get hit. They, they, they reason with money. So probably in their crooked mind, one victim costs less than a hyperbaric chamber, hospital staff, and so on. I don't want to be blunt. Yeah. So... The, the result is to bring more potential victims there and grow the tourism. Yeah. I am going to be talking about in-water recompression <clears throat> tomorrow. So, um, yeah, Good. if I can, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, okay. tomorrow. So you'll hear all about in-water recompression. Yeah. Okay, Kirk? Yeah, so free diving over the last five years has exploded. <clears throat> and I think if you look at snorkelers and you put them under my market segment, it's dwarfs or at least bumps up against the participation of recreational scuba diving or and technical diving. I think, in fact, if you look at the amount of dives that a free diver will do in a day, uh, it can be dozens. And if you're a harvester, it can be upwards of 100. 
And when we're doing dives in the 20 to 30 meter range, we can have bottom times that are two to three times that of what a scuba diver would do. Um, we get decompression sickness. I have several friends that have. I am personally have had a, a problem with it. And, um, and, and yet there's no decompression modeling or algorithms that are specific to freediving. We have research study decompression in scuba and technical and commercial. I mean, all we're doing is polishing an already polished thing, trying to make it that much better from a scuba point of view. And yet there's this market segment that is massive and only growing bigger and getting more and more participation. And yet is there studies are there are there research are there studies when when am i going to have in my shear water the surface interval countdown timer telling me when i should do the next dive so that i don't suffer decompression sickness the, uh, the answer is yes but it's not yet well developed uh, but as a as a continuation of the study on, on free divers that we are doing essentially with Umberto Perizzari and his Apnea Academy home, I think you know well. Um, we started with pulmonary edema because that was the most relevant factor and most common factor. Now we are focusing on equalization and uh, also using mm, mechanical mobilization of, of the jaw with bites and, and, and something like that. And uh, we have started studying a num the number of uh, Taravana cases we had by monitoring uh, also uh, echocardiog uh, echocardiography and the vis visibility or production of bubbles with very dissatisfying results because we had hits without bubbles and lots of bubbles with no hits. Um, we try are trying to develop a, uh, an algorithm uh, that puts together both the uh, depth, the time at depth, the surface interval, which you know better than me, it's a critical issue. And there, there are promising results, a bit early probably, but we can talk more about that later. Yes, but the answer is yes, there is study ongoing on that. It's essentially on, on I, I prefer calling it the Taravana, uh, but um, on, on free diving decompression sickness, yes. Sorry, which is probably not so linked to bubbles. Yeah, I, <laughs> I don't want to sound too nihilistic about it, but I think you're going to be waiting a long time for validated decompression algorithms for you know for technical free diving. I, I mean, I you know no disrespect to Sandro and what he's attempting to do. Where we're at with decompression for compressed gas diving now has taken us a century of mucking around trial and error and very, very expensive input from people like the US Navy doing you know, thousands of experimental dives. That's what you need for a validated algorithm. And I think, I think it's gonna be very challenging to find those kind of data for the myriad you know, combinations of and permutations of free dives that could possibly be done out there. I, I, I'm not saying it'll never happen, but I think it's going to be a while. You know, it's that's a big job. It, it's really hard to develop those kind of algorithms. Definitely not the easiest thing. <clears throat> no. Dr. John, Dr. John Fitz Clark um, started to develop something from Dalhousie that was based on the DCIM tables because it's probably one of the most uh, studied aspect and he's developed a multiplication factor or uh, yeah <laughs> I mirrored something like that and so yeah it would be interesting and I'm not looking at it from the technical I'm just looking at it from just free divers going to 20 meters I mean the last spearfishing world championships multiple uh, incidences of decompression sickness just simply we're at the point now in our training where previously we couldn't go as deep or stay as long but we're well past that now yeah we, we we've we've gone in the ability of pushing ourselves in into uh you know surface intervals needing to be understood and and having something that will guide us through that yeah. extrapolating from existing tables is one way of doing it however 
my point was that validating those extrapolations is going to be very time consuming and difficult. I mean, it'll get, you'll get there, but it's going to take a while. Yeah. Okay, we have another question. Yeah. Um, um, when we dive extremely deep, uh, deeper than, uh, let's say, let's say uh, 200 meters, especially in caves. Uh, this is uh, what I like, for example. And um, uh, of course, we think uh, how to reduce uh, the decompression time, of course. And uh, we do some tricks. Uh, some people know about that. Uh, but my, my question about uh, oxygen. So uh, we know, and everyone knows here probably about the regular stuff like uh, PPO2, 1.6, uh, uh, gas, gas breaks, uh, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, common stuff. Uh, at the same time, uh, we know uh, that uh, uh, there are some guys in the world. Uh, they are one of the leaders uh, for extremely deep dive. Uh, and they start to use oxygen uh, from the depth, uh, uh, as far as I know, from 12 meters, uh, pure oxygen for decompression. And for example, uh, one of my, my friends, uh, uh, he had an experience with 12,000 of CNS. Uh, and my question is, uh, uh, do, you, uh, do you know, or probably do you do some research with that guys for that extremely aggressive uh, impaction of oxygen to uh, people's bodies. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> well, I think um, I, I think first, if you want to go deep in caves, you have to be prepared to do the decompression. And uh, you know, I do keep d deep cave diving, and I'm involved with a team that does very deep cave diving. You know, in the Pierce, the last year, in 2020, we pushed it to 245 meters and it was a 16 hour dive in uh, six degree water. I can tell you that nobody on that dive breathed a PO2 greater than 1.3. And the bottom line is, for me as a, as a deep technical diver, I fear oxygen toxicity way more than I fear decompression sickness because I know I can avoid decompression sickness and I avoid it by doing the time that's required to avoid it, not by uh, trying to overly accelerate decompression by breathing very high pressures of oxygen. And I think people that do that uh, have got a poor sense of risk versus benefit or sorry, probably more like relative risk. I think that the risk of breathing high PO2s at the end of a dive in cold water is is quite significant whereas you know spending a bit of extra time and setting the place up so that you can do that is the way to go so you know when we're doing deep caves in cold water we have habitats we have a heating cable from the or power cable from the surface so you can plug in your suit heating at multiple depths all the way up so you've got unlimited power the habitats are a big part of it, though, being able to get out of the water and just sit in those. You can eat and drink and all that kind of stuff. I do not think the answer to decompressing from very deep cave dives is pushing your PO2. I think it's finding ways of making the decompression doable. And in those, in that sense, I would suggest habitats and, and unlimited suit heating. <clears throat> In Portugal, uh, yeah, we use. Yeah, but I do that. Oh. Okay. Yeah, 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 I did it. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, in Portugal, uh, when we dive uh, deeply, we use uh, habitat, of course, uh, uh, and uh, all that stuff uh, which you mentioned it. Uh, yeah, uh, but, but anyway, uh, so uh, yeah, thinking about uh, to find something more. And for example, um, uh, what do you think about to change gases? Uh, to change gases uh, uh, when, you, when, you, uh, when you use uh, uh, rebreathers, uh, dual rebreathers, uh, you can change gases like you, like you do in open circle, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, what do you think about that? A dual switch. Yeah. Uh, sorry? A diluent switch. Yeah. Well, you can do that. Uh, 
So you're talking about moving from a helium diluent to a to nitrogen, basically, as a way of accelerating elimination of helium. In theory, that is an advantage, but whether it's a true advantage is uncertain. I'm not sure if you uh, had seen the work that David Doulette did in sheep comparing helium and nitrogen kinetics in the tissues that are of interest to us. But what he found was that the assumptions about the differing rates of diffusion of those gases were flawed and that dual switches might not make that much difference to it, your to your decompression. Yeah, it is it is uh, the big... Yeah. Yeah, for example, for uh, our profile in alveolar cave, uh, the difference between uh, we change... Uh, the gases uh, for uh, three mix with uh, less uh, portion of, of alum. Uh, and uh, if you just uh, use the same bottom gas, uh, is uh, one and a half hours. Yeah. So it's it's a lot. Uh, and uh, okay, we are going to dive uh, uh, plus uh, further and uh, let's say uh, to to rise our decompression total decompression time uh, for let's say twelve hours. Now, now we experienced eight, um, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, we need some some ideas how to reduce the compression time because uh, more than twelve hours, even if you have uh, 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 habitats, uh, uh, even if uh, we change uh, gases, uh, uh, anyway, we, we need something, some some instruments. Uh, do you know about uh, some more tricks? <laughs> Oh, you want you want Thanks. some magic? Uh, yeah, <laughs> you should use a bubble model. That's a joke, by the way. Um, <laughs> no, no. I, look, I, there are strategies for shortening decompression, oh, but I don't think pushing your oxygen very high is a good one. Uh, you could do that a little bit more safely in a habitat. I wouldn't do it in the water. Uh, and dual switches is a way you can do it. Whether the advantage is real or not, I can't tell you for sure. And I don't believe there's anyone in the world that can. There is some basis for believing that the advantage might not be as big as Bullman thought it was when he considered the different kinetics of those gases. I think you know what I'm saying, right? <clears throat> But you could do the dual switch and follow what a Bullman gradient factor algorithm would tell you, which would be a shorter decompression. And the truth of it will be when you get out of the water, if you're well, uh, it worked. And if you're not, it didn't, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay, so um, we have to 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 close okay. the, yeah. the talks for, for today. And we need to have you in, in a condition that you can speak tomorrow. So let's not push too hard. Thank you very much. I think it was interesting, the, Thank you both. the, the discussion. And tomorrow we will have more from you. And we will start um, at 10 a.m. also with the debate with other three uh, intervenients, but with also with this format. So let's see if tomorrow is so, so uh with so many questions like 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 we had today. Thank you very much, Dan, for right, for right. moderating, right. Alessandro and Simon. Thank you. Good job, Dylan. Good job. Good job.